Alexander the Great, also known as Alexander III or Alexander of Macedonia, King of Macedonia, who overthrew the Persian Empire, carried Macedonian arms to India, and laid the foundations for the Hellenistic world of territorial kingdoms. Already in his lifetime the subject of fabulous stories, he later became the hero of a full-scale legend bearing only the sketchiest resemblance to his historical career. He was born in 356 BCE at Pella in Macedonia, the son of Philip II and Olympias. From age 13 to 16 he was taught by Aristotle, who inspired him with an interest in philosophy, medicine, and scientific investigation, but he was later to advance beyond his teacher's narrow precept that non-Greeks should be treated as slaves. Left in charge of Macedonia in 340 during Philip's attack on Byzantium, Alexander defeated the Medi, a Thracian people. Two years later he commanded the left wing at the Battle of Coronia, in which Philip defeated the allied Greek states, and displayed personal courage in breaking the sacred band of Thebes, an elite military corps composed of 150 pairs of lovers. A year later Philip divorced Olympias, and, after a quarrel at a feast held to celebrate his father's new marriage, Alexander and his mother fled to Epirus, and Alexander later went to Illyria. Shortly afterward, father and son were reconciled and Alexander returned, but his position as heir was jeopardized. In 336, however, on Philip's assassination, Alexander, acclaimed by the army, succeeded without opposition. He at once executed the princes of Lincestes, alleged to be behind Philip's murder, along with all possible rivals and the whole of the faction opposed to him. He then marched south, recovered a wavering Thessaly, and at an assembly of the Greek League of Corinth was appointed Generalissimo for the forthcoming invasion of Asia, already planned and initiated by Philip. Returning to Macedonia by way of Delphi, he advanced into Thrace in spring 335 and, after forcing the Shipka Pass and crushing the Tribeli, crossed the Danube to disperse the Getty, turning west, he then defeated and shattered a coalition of Illyrians who had invaded Macedonia. Meanwhile, a rumor of his death had precipitated a revolt of Theban Democrats. Other Greek states favored Thebes, and the Athenians, urged on by Demosthenes, voted help. In 14 days Alexander marched 240 miles from Pelion in Illyria to Thebes. When the Thebans refused to surrender, he made an entry and razed their city to the ground, sparing only temples and Pindar's house. 6,000 were killed and all survivors sold into slavery. The other Greek states were cowed by this severity, and Alexander could afford to treat Athens leniently. Macedonian garrisons were left in Corinth, Chalcis, and the Cadmia. From his accession Alexander had set his mind on the Persian expedition. He had grown up to the idea. Moreover, he needed the wealth of Persia if he was to maintain the army built by Philip and pay off the 500 talents he owed. The exploits of the 10,000 Greek soldiers of fortune and of Aegisilaus of Sparta in successfully campaigning in Persian territory had revealed the vulnerability of the Persian Empire. With a good cavalry force Alexander could expect to defeat any Persian army. In spring 334 he crossed the Dardanelles, leaving Antipater, who had already faithfully served his father, as his deputy in Europe with over 13,000 men. He himself commanded about 30 feet and over 5,000 cavalry, of whom nearly 14,000 were Macedonians and about 7,000 allies sent by the Greek League. This army was to prove remarkable for its balanced combination of arms. Much work fell on the light-armed Cretan and Macedonian archers, Thracians, and the Agrinian javelin men. But in pitched battle the striking force was the cavalry, and the core of the army, should the issue still remain undecided after the cavalry charge, was the infantry phalanx, 9,000 strong, armed with 13 feet spears and shields, and the 3,000 men of the royal battalions, the hypospists. Alexander's second in command was Parmenio, who had secured a foothold in Asia Minor during Philip's lifetime. Many of his family and supporters were entrenched in positions of responsibility. The army was accompanied by surveyors, engineers, architects, scientists, court officials, and historians. From the outset Alexander seems to have envisaged an unlimited operation. 
In winter 334,333 Alexander conquered Western Asia Minor, subduing the hill tribes of Lycia and Pisidia. And in spring 333 he advanced along the coastal road to Perga, passing the cliffs of Mount Climax. Thanks to a fortunate change of wind, the fall in the level of the sea was interpreted as a mark of divine favor by Alexander's flatterers, including the historian Callisthenes. At Gordium and Phrygia, tradition records his cutting of the Gordian knot, which could only be loosed by the man who was to rule Asia, but this story may be apocryphal or at least distorted. At this point Alexander benefited from the sudden death of Memnon, the competent Greek commander of the Persian fleet. From Gordium he pushed on to Ensira and then south through Cappadocia and the Cilician Gates, a fever held him up for a time in Cilicia. Meanwhile, Darius with his grand army had advanced northward on the eastern side of Mount Aminus. Intelligence on both sides was faulty, and Alexander was already encamped by Myriandrus when he learned that Darius was astride his line of communications at Issus, north of Alexander's position. Turning, Alexander found Darius drawn up along the Pinarus River. In the battle that followed, Alexander won a decisive victory. The struggle turned into a Persian rout and Darius fled, leaving his family in Alexander's hands. The women were treated with chivalrous care. Conquest of the Mediterranean coast and Egypt For Mrs. Alexander marched south into Syria and Phoenicia, his object being to isolate the Persian fleet from its bases and so to destroy it as an effective fighting force. The Phoenician cities Marathas and Aratus came over quietly, and Parmenio was sent ahead to secure Damascus and its rich booty, including Darius's war chest. In reply to a letter from Darius offering peace, Alexander replied arrogantly, recapitulating the historic wrongs of Greece and demanding unconditional surrender to himself as Lord of Asia. After taking Byblos and Sidon, he met with a check at Tyre, where he was refused entry into the island city. He thereupon prepared to use all methods of siegecraft to take it, but the Tyrians resisted, holding out for seven months. In the meantime the Persians had counterattacked by land in Asia Minor, where they were defeated by Antigonus, the satrap of Greater Phrygia, and by sea, recapturing a number of cities and islands. While the siege of Tyre was in progress, Darius sent a new offer. He would pay a huge ransom of 10,000 talents for his family and cede all his lands west of the Euphrates. I would accept. Parmenio is reported to have said, Were I Alexander, I too, was the famous retort, Were I Parmenio. The storming of Tyre in July 332 was Alexander's greatest military achievement. It was attended with great carnage and the sale of the women and children into slavery. Leaving Parmenio in Syria, Alexander advanced south without opposition until he reached Gaza on its high mound. Their bitter resistance halted him for two months, and he sustained a serious shoulder wound during a sortie. There is no basis for the tradition that he turned aside to visit Jerusalem. In November 332 he reached Egypt. The people welcomed him as their deliverer, and the Persian satrap Mazaces wisely surrendered. At Memphis Alexander sacrificed to appease, the Greek term for happy, the sacred Egyptian bull, and was crowned with the traditional double crown of the pharaohs, the native priests were placated and their religion encouraged. He spent the winter organizing Egypt, where he employed Egyptian governors, keeping the army under a separate Macedonian command. He founded the city of Alexandria near the western arm of the Nile on a fine site between the sea and Lake Merodes, protected by the island of pharaohs, and had it laid out by the Rhodian architect Denocrates. He is also said to have sent an expedition to discover the causes of the flooding of the Nile. From Alexandria he marched along the coast to Peritoneum and from there inland to visit the celebrated oracle of the god Ammon. The difficult journey was later embroidered with flattering legends. On his reaching the oracle in its oasis, the priest gave him the traditional salutation of a pharaoh. As son of Ammon, Alexander consulted the god on the success of his expedition but revealed the reply to no one. Later the incident was to contribute to the story that he was the son of Zeus and, thus, to his deification. In spring 331 he returned to Tyre, appointed a Macedonian satrap for Syria, and prepared to advance into Mesopotamia. His conquest of Egypt had completed his control of the whole eastern Mediterranean coast. In July 331 Alexander was at Thapsacus on the Euphrates. Instead of taking the direct route down the river to Babylon, he made across northern Mesopotamia toward the Tigris and Darius. Learning of this move from an advance force sent under Mazius to the Euphrates crossing, marched up the Tigris to oppose him. The decisive battle of the war was fought on October 31st, on the plain of Gogamla between Nineveh and Arbella. Alexander pursued the defeated Persian forces for 35 miles to Arbella, but Darius escaped with his Bactrian cavalry and Greek mercenaries into Media. Alexander now occupied Babylon, city and province, Mazius, who surrendered it, was confirmed as satrap in conjunction with a Macedonian troop commander, and quite exceptionally was granted the right to coin. As in Egypt, the local priesthood was encouraged. Susa, the capital, also surrendered, releasing huge treasures amounting to 50,000 gold talents. Here Alexander established Darius's family in comfort. Crushing the mountain tribe of the Auxians, he now pressed on over the Zagros range into Persia proper and, successfully turning the pass of the Persian gates, held by the satrap Ariabarzanes, he entered Persepolis and Pasargadi. 
At Persepolis he ceremonially burned down the palace of Xerxes, as a symbol that the Panhellenic War of Revenge was at an end. For such seems the probable significance of an act that tradition later explained as a drunken frolic inspired by Ties, an Athenian courtesan. In spring 330 Alexander marched north into Media and occupied its capital. The Thessalians and Greek allies were sent home, hence a forward he was waging a purely personal war. As Masius's appointment indicated, Alexander's views on the empire were changing. He had come to envisage a joint ruling people consisting of Macedonians and Persians, and this served to augment the misunderstanding that now arose between him and his people. Before continuing his pursuit of Darius, who had retreated into Bactria, he assembled all the Persian treasure and entrusted it to Harpalus, who was to hold it at Ecbatana as chief treasurer. Parmenio was also left behind in media to control communications. The presence of this older man had perhaps become irksome. In midsummer 330 Alexander set out for the eastern provinces at a high speed via Regae and the Caspian Gates, where he learned that Bessus, the satrap of Bactria, had deposed Darius. After a skirmish near modern Sharad, the usurper had Darius stabbed and left him to die. Alexander sent his body for burial with due honors in the royal tombs at Persepolis. Campaign eastward to Central Asia Bessus was now in Bactria raising a national revolt in the eastern satrapies with the usurped title of Great King. Crossing the Hindu Kush northward over the Kalwek Pass, Alexander brought his army, despite food shortages, to Drepsaka, outflanked. Bessus fled beyond the Oxus, and Alexander, marching west to Bactria Zariaspa, appointed loyal satraps in Bactria and area. Crossing the Oxus, he sent his general Ptolemy in pursuit of Bessus, who had meanwhile been overthrown by the Sogdian Spitamines. Bessus was captured, flogged, and sent to Bactra, where he was later mutilated after the Persian manner. In due course he was publicly executed at Ecbatana. From Maracanda Alexander advanced by way of Seropolis to the Jaxarts, the boundary of the Persian Empire. There he broke the opposition of the Scythian nomads by his use of catapults and, after defeating them in a battle on the north bank of the river, pursued them into the interior. On the site of modern Leninabad on the Jaxarts, he founded a city, Alexandria Eshate, the farthest. Meanwhile, Spidamines had raised all Sogdiana in revolt behind him, bringing in the Masagedi, a people of the Shaka Confederacy. It took Alexander until the autumn of 328 to crush the most determined opponent he encountered in his campaigns. Later in the same year he attacked Oxyarts and the remaining barons who held out in the hills of Peredicene. Volunteers seized the crag on which Oxyarts had his stronghold, and among the captives was his daughter, Roxana. In reconciliation Alexander married her, and the rest of his opponents were either won over or crushed. An incident that occurred at Maracanda widened the breach between Alexander and many of his Macedonians. He murdered Cladus, one of his most trusted commanders, in a drunken quarrel, but his excessive display of remorse led the army to pass a decree convicting Cladus posthumously of treason. 
The event marked a step in Alexander's progress toward Eastern absolutism, and this growing attitude found its outward expression in his use of Persian royal dress. Shortly afterward, at Bactra, he attempted to impose the Persian court ceremonial, involving prostration on the Greeks and Macedonians too. But to them this custom, habitual for Persians entering the king's presence, implied an act of worship and was intolerable before a human. Even Callisthenes, historian and nephew of Aristotle, whose ostentatious flattery had perhaps encouraged Alexander to see himself in the role of a god, refused to abase himself. Macedonian laughter caused the experiment to founder, and Alexander abandoned it. Shortly afterward, however, Callisthenes was held to be privy to a conspiracy among the royal pages and was executed. Resentment of this action alienated sympathy from Alexander within the peripatetic school of philosophers, with which Callisthenes had close connections. Invasion of India In early summer 327 Alexander left Bactria with a reinforced army under a reorganized command. If Plutarch's figure of 120,000 men has any reality, however, it must include all kinds of auxiliary services, together with muleteers, camel drivers, medical corps, peddlers, entertainers, women, and children. The fighting strength perhaps stood at about 35,000. Recrossing the Hindu Kush, probably by Bamiyan and the Gorban Valley, Alexander divided his forces. Half the army with the baggage under Hephaestion and Perdiccas, both cavalry commanders, was sent through the Khyber Pass, while he himself led the rest, together with his siege train, through the hills to the north. His advance through Swat and Genhera was marked by the storming of the almost impregnable pinnacle of Aornos, the modern Persar, a few miles west of the Indus and north of the Buna River, an impressive feat of siegecraft. In spring 326, crossing the Indus near Atak, Alexander entered Taxila, whose ruler, Taxiles, furnished elephants and troops in return for aid against his rival Porus, who ruled the lands between the Hydasps and the Assessines. In June Alexander fought his last great battle on the left bank of the Hydasps. He founded two cities there, Alexandria, Nikia, and Bucephala, and Porus became his ally. How much Alexander knew of India beyond the Hyphoses is uncertain. There is no conclusive proof that he had heard of the Ganges. But he was anxious to press on farther, and he had advanced to the Hyphoses when his army mutinied, refusing to go farther in the tropical rain. They were weary in body and spirit, and Coenus, one of Alexander's four chief marshals, acted as their spokesman. On finding the army adamant, Alexander agreed to turn back. On the Hyphoses he erected twelve altars to the twelve Olympian gods, and on the Hydasps he built a fleet of eight hundred to one thousand ships. Leaving Porus, he then proceeded down the river and into the Indus, with half his forces on shipboard and half marching in three columns down the two banks. The fleet was commanded by Nearchus, and Alexander's own captain was one Secritus, both later wrote accounts of the campaign. The march was attended with much fighting and heavy, pitiless slaughter. At the storming of one town of the Mali near the Hydriots River, Alexander received a severe wound which left him weakened. On reaching Patala, located at the head of the Indus Delta, he built a harbor and docks and explored both arms of the Indus, which probably then ran into the Ran of Ketch. He planned to lead part of his forces back by land, while the rest in perhaps 100 to 150 ships under the command of Nearchus, a Cretan with naval experience, made a voyage of exploration along the Persian Gulf. Local opposition led Nearchus to set sail in September, and he was held up for three weeks until he could pick up the northeast monsoon in late October. In September Alexander II set out along the coast through Jidroja, but he was soon compelled by mountainous country to turn inland, thus failing in his project to establish food depots for the fleet. Craterus, a high-ranking officer, already had been sent off with the baggage and siege train, the elephants, and the sick and wounded, together with three battalions of the phalanx, by way of the Mullah Pass, Quetta, and Kandahar into the Helmand Valley. From there he was to march through Drangiana to rejoin the main army on the Amanis River in Carmania. Alexander's march through Jidrosia proved disastrous. Waterless desert and shortage of food and fuel caused great suffering, and many, especially women and children, perished in a sudden monsoon flood while encamped in a wadi. At length, at the Amanis, he was rejoined by Nearchus and the fleet, which also had suffered losses. Alexander now proceeded farther with the policy of replacing senior officials and executing defaulting governors on which he had already embarked before leaving India. Between 326 and 324 over a third of his satraps were superseded and six were put to death, including the Persian satraps of Persis, Susiana, Carmania, and Paradisine. Three generals in media, including Cleander, the brother of Coenus, were accused of extortion and summoned to Carmania, where they were arrested, tried, and executed. How far the rigor that from now onward Alexander displayed against his governors represents exemplary punishment for gross maladministration during his absence, and how far the elimination of men he had come to distrust is debatable. But the ancient sources generally favorable to him comment adversely on his severity. In spring 324 he was back in Susa, capital of Elam and administrative center of the Persian Empire. The story of his journey through Carmania in a drunken revel, dressed as Dionysus, is embroidered, if not wholly apocryphal.
he found that his treasurer, Harpellus, evidently fearing punishment for peculation, had absconded with six thousand mercenaries and five thousand talents to Greece. Arrested in Athens, he escaped and later was murdered in Crete. At Susa, Alexander held a feast to celebrate the seizure of the Persian Empire, at which, in furtherance of his policy of fusing Macedonians and Persians into one master race, he and eighty of his officers took Persian wives, he and Hephaestion married Darius's daughters Barsine and Dryptes, respectively, and ten thousand of his soldiers with native wives were given generous dowries. This policy of racial fusion brought increasing friction to Alexander's relations with his Macedonians, who had no sympathy for his changed concept of the empire. His determination to incorporate Persians on equal terms in the army and the administration of the provinces was bitterly resented. This discontent was now fanned by the arrival of 30,000 native youths who had received a Macedonian military training and by the introduction of Asian peoples from Bactria, Sogdiana, Rakosia, and other parts of the empire into the companion cavalry. Whether Asians had previously served with the companions is uncertain, but if so they must have formed separate squadrons. In addition, Persian nobles had been accepted into the royal cavalry bodyguard. Eusestus, the new governor of Persis, gave this policy full support to flatter Alexander, but most Macedonians saw it as a threat to their own privileged position. The issue came to a head at Opis, when Alexander's decision to send home Macedonian veterans under Craterus was interpreted as a move toward transferring the seat of power to Asia. There was an open mutiny involving all but the royal bodyguard, but when Alexander dismissed his whole army and enrolled Persians instead, the opposition broke down. An emotional scene of reconciliation was followed by a vast banquet with 9,000 guests to celebrate the ending of the misunderstand and the partnership in government of Macedonians and Persians, but not, as has been argued, the incorporation of all the subject peoples as partners in the Commonwealth. 10,000 veterans were now sent back to Macedonia with gifts, and the crisis was surmounted. In summer 324 Alexander attempted to solve another problem that of the wandering mercenaries, of whom there were thousands in Asia and Greece, many of them political exiles from their own cities. A decree brought by Nicanor to Europe and proclaimed at Olympia required the Greek cities of the Greek League to receive back all exiles and their families, a measure that implied some modification of the oligarchic regimes maintained in the Greek cities by Alexander's governor Antipater. Alexander now planned to recall Antipater and supersede him by Craterus, but he was to die before this could be done. In autumn 324 Hephaestion died in Ecbatana, and Alexander indulged in extravagant mourning for his closest friend, he was given a royal funeral in Babylon with a pyre costing 10,000 talents. His post of Chiliarch was left unfilled. It was probably in connection with a general order now sent out to the Greeks to honor Hephaestion as a hero that Alexander linked the demand that he himself should be accorded divine honors. For a long time his mind had dwelt on ideas of Godhead. Greek thought drew no very decided line of demarcation between God and man, for legend offered more than one example of men who, by their achievements, acquired divine status. Alexander had on several occasions encouraged favorable comparison of his own accomplishments with those of Dionysus or Heracles. He now seems to have become convinced of the reality of his own divinity and to have required its acceptance by others. There is no reason to assume that his demand had any political background, it was rather a symptom of growing megalomania and emotional instability. The cities perforce complied, but often ironically, the Spartan decree read, since Alexander wishes to be a god, let him be a god. In the winter of 324 Alexander carried out a savage punitive expedition against the Cassians in the hills of Luristan. The following spring at Babylon he received complimentary embassies from the Libyans and from the Bruttians, Etruscans, and Lucanians of Italy. But the story that embassies also came from more distant peoples, such as Carthaginians, Celts, Iberians, and even Romans, is a later invention. Representatives of the cities of Greece also came, garlanded as befitted Alexander's divine status. Following up Nearchus's voyage, he now founded an Alexandria at the mouth of the Tigris and made plans to develop sea communications with India, for which an expedition along the Arabian coast was to be a preliminary. He also dispatched Heraclades, an officer, to explore the Hyrcanian Sea. Suddenly, in Babylon, while busy with plans to improve the irrigation of the Euphrates and to settle the coast of the Persian Gulf, Alexander was taken ill after a prolonged banquet and drinking bout. Ten days later, on June 13, 323, he died in his 33rd year. He had reigned for 12 years and 8 months. His body, diverted to Egypt by Ptolemy, the later king, was eventually placed in a golden coffin in Alexandria. Both in Egypt and elsewhere in the Greek cities he received divine honors. No heir had been appointed to the throne, and his generals adopted Philip II's half-witted illegitimate son, Philip Hideous, and Alexander's posthumous son by Roxana, Alexander IV, his kings, sharing out the satrapies among themselves, after much bargaining. The empire could hardly survive Alexander's death as a unit. Both kings were murdered, or hideous in 317 and Alexander in 310 over 309. The provinces became independent kingdoms, and the generals, following Antigonus's lead in 306, took the title of king.
of Alexander's plans little reliable information survives. The far-reaching schemes for the conquest of the Western Mediterranean and the setting up of a universal monarchy, recorded by Diodorus Siculus, a first-century Greek historian, are probably based on a later forgery. If not, they were at once jettisoned by his successors and the army. Had he lived, he would no doubt have completed the conquest of Asia Minor, where Paphlagonia, Cappadocia, and Armenia still maintained an effective independence. But in his later years Alexander's aims seem to have been directed toward exploration, in particular of Arabia and the Caspian. In the organization of his empire, Alexander had been content in many spheres to improvise and adapt what he found. His financial policy is an exception. Though the details cannot be wholly recovered, it is clear that he set up a central organization with collectors perhaps independent of the local satraps. That this proved a failure was partly due to weaknesses in the character of Harpalus, his chief treasurer. But the establishment of a new coinage with a silver standard based on that of Athens in place of the old bimetallic system current both in Macedonia and in Persia helped trade everywhere, combined with the release of vast amounts of bullion from the Persian treasuries, gave a much-needed fillip to the economy of the whole Mediterranean area. Alexander's foundation of new cities, Plutarch speaks of over 70, initiated a new chapter in Greek expansion. No doubt many of the colonists, by no means volunteers, deserted these cities, and marriages with native women led to some dilution of Greek ways. But the Greek influence remained strong in most of them, and since the process was carried further by Alexander's Seleucid successors, the spread of Hellenic thought and customs over much of Asia as far as Bactria and India was one of the more striking effects of Alexander's conquests. His plans for racial fusion, on the other hand, were a failure. The Iranian satraps were perhaps not efficient, for, out of eighteen, ten were removed or executed, with what justice it is no longer possible to say. But, more important, the Macedonians, leaders and men alike, rejected the idea, and in the later Seleucid Empire the Greek and Macedonian element was to be clearly dominant. How far Alexander would have succeeded in the difficult task of coordinating his vast dominions, had he lived, is hard to determine. The only link between the many units that went to make up an empire more disparate than that of the Habsburgs, and far larger, was his own person, and his death came before he could tackle this problem. What had so far held it all together was his own dynamic personality. He combined an iron will and ability to drive himself and his men to the utmost with a supple and flexible mind. He knew when to draw back and change his policy, though he did this reluctantly. He was imaginative and not without romantic impulses. Figures like Achilles, Heracles, and Dionysus were often in his mind, and the salutation at the Oracle of Ammon clearly influenced his thoughts and ambitions ever afterward. He was swift in anger, and under the strain of his long campaigns this side of his character grew more pronounced. Ruthless and self-willed, he had increasing recourse to terror, showing no hesitation in eliminating men whom he had ceased to trust, either with or without the pretense of a fair trial. Years after his death, Cassander, son of Antipater, a regent of the Macedonian Empire under Alexander, could not pass his statue at Delphi without shuddering. Yet he maintained the loyalty of his men, who followed him to the Hyphosis without complaining and continued to believe in him throughout all hardships. Only when his whim would have taken them still farther into unknown India did he fail to get his way. As a general Alexander is among the greatest the world has known. He showed unusual versatility both in the combination of different arms and in adapting his tactics to the challenge of enemies who commanded novel forms of warfare, the Shaka nomads, the Indian hill tribes, or Porus with his elephants. His strategy was skillful and imaginative, and he knew how to exploit the chances that arise in every battle and may be decisive for victory or defeat. He also drew the last advantage from victory by relentless pursuit. His use of cavalry was so effective that he rarely had to fall back upon his infantry to deliver the crushing blow. Alexander's short reign marks a decisive moment in the history of Europe and Asia. His expedition and his own personal interest in scientific investigation brought many advances in the knowledge of geography and natural history. His career led to the moving of the great centers of civilization eastward and initiated the new age of the Greek territorial monarchies. It spread Hellenism in a vast colonizing wave throughout the Middle East and created, if not politically at least economically and culturally, a single world stretching from Gibraltar to the Punjab, open to trade and social intercourse and with a considerable overlay of common civilization and the Greek coin as a lingua franca. It is not untrue to say that the Roman Empire, the spread of Christianity as a world religion, and the long centuries of Byzantium were all in some degree the fruits of Alexander's achievement. 